Judge Shapiro, I'm seeing that we have an attorney for the plaintiff as well as the defendant, so we can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, I am ready. We're still waiting for the court reporter to move on over to panelists. Okay. There we go. I am here, in the court reporter. Oh, very good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mr. S Ms. Can everyone hear me? Yes, Your Honor. Good. All right. So, Mr. Sands, are you here for Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay. On behalf of the state. All right. And it's David Collins. Very good. All yes. right. We'll call the case. And if uh, I'll have you argue, but just put your appearance on the record when you uh, when it's your turn. All right. So, I'm uh, this is in the Court of Claims, and I'm calling the matter of Michael James Ofinski, the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. Uh, docket number 21-100MZ, and um, this is the uh, plaintiff's, pardon me, this is the appeal from the uh, decision of uh, administrative agency, and uh, then we'll begin, therefore, with the appellant, who I presume is uh, Mr. Coleman, right? That's correct, Your Honor. Good afternoon. All right, may it please the court, Dave Palman appearing on behalf of Mr. Oginski. Um, just want to uh, address a couple of items and then get right to your questions that you raised, Judge, in the notice. Um, first, there was some implication in the Attorney General's brief that my client <clears throat> had his license uh, uh, taken because of some character issues and things like that. And I just we had mentioned it in our brief that that was not accurate, and the ALJ did not make any findings uh, along those lines that there was no character <laughs> issue. So I just want to make sure we, we had that on the record. Um, now, as far as a couple of the arguments that I just want to address directly and then get to the question, um, the AG argues in their brief that the YTA statute permits access, is, is the phrase, to the criminal <laughs> record. Could you get a little closer to the mic? Sure. Sorry, Judge. Great. Thank you. Is this better? Much better. Is that better? Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, that the word that the statute allows access to the to the records of a YTA um, uh, you know, case. And that therefore, because there's access, that the state has access to it that that means they're, they're then jumping to the conclusion that that means they have the right to use it against somebody. I, I don't see where the word access equals that right to use it against somebody at all for licensing mm -hmm. purposes I'm talking about. It does say that they can have access, for example, if somebody has been charged with a particular crime and received YTA status, obviously that record needs to be there so that they wouldn't be given YTA again. You know, I mean, there's lots of reasons to have access. That does not negate the section that we cite where it talks about, um, you know, very clearly that no greater civil, dis civil disability, loss of a right or a privilege can be imposed, you know, the MCL 762.14. So, um, it doesn't even have to be a vested right. The AG makes that argument in their brief. Well, he doesn't have a vested right. Well, to begin with, that's not in the statute. Vested is not there. And even if the court, if your honor felt that it wasn't a right, there's still a civil disability and there's still a privilege <laughs> that is right to exercise his profession. So I don't see where that has any weight in what we're arguing about here. Um, I also found it interesting that the AG raised the, Temelkowski case, which is a case we heavily relied on in our brief, um, that the M. Cole's amendment raised licensing standards 
Uh, obviously, that's true. Made them tougher uh, by including this YTA um, past history issue. Um, but then they jump to the, the statement and they say in their brief, and it can be applied retroactively. And then they cite Temelkowski for it. Well, that's the very case we cite, Judge, and say that it can't be used retroactively. So I, I really did not understand uh, their argument there. Um, the Michigan Supreme Court has already ruled that SORA, which is a civil penalty, a civil statute, the Sex Offender Registry Act, could not be applied retroactively because it changed the plea deal and the benefits of the YTA deal that the defendant in that case had. So that was clearly a due process violation. So I really fail to see how the Temelkowski case supports the AG's uh, position. Um, the last thing I'll just say on the ex post facto, ex post facto issue, I'll rely on our brief there unless your honor has any specific questions. But um, the AG kind of dealt with it and just argued, well, you can do it retroactively because it's civil. Well, again, the Temelkowski case says otherwise. And also the cases we cite in our brief talk about the individualized aspect uh, of all of this, that you can't apply a broad brush to everybody in the category. And I'll just rely on our brief on that, unless your honor has any questions on that. So to get to the particular questions, your honor, that you sent us, um, the first question dealing with, is there a conflict between the cited statutes? Um, I guess I have two answers. And as lawyers, we always want to have two answers, right? <laughs> My first answer would be, no, there, there is no conflict as long as the law is applied prospectively. Then there's no conflict because then it wouldn't have any impact on our client and it would not be uh, applied retroactively. But here, obviously, the issue is they're trying to apply it retroactively. So in that sense, there could be a conflict, but I would still argue the Temelkowski case is right on point. And um, our Michigan Supreme Court has already ruled that the legislature may not add civil penalties retroactively to YTA pleas. I mean, this was a very specific case. It dealt with a YTA case, just like ours. Yeah, I'm and, familiar with it. I pre-read it before we began. Yeah, um, so I, I would just say that in that sense, then there's no conflict because if we follow Temelkowski, um, you know, that my client's entitled to the benefits of his plea deal, to the, it's a settled transaction, it'd be a manifest injustice, all the things, the Davis case we cite on page 10. I, you know, I, I think then it's clear if, if that case is followed, the Supreme Court precedent is followed, there's no conflict per se because the Supreme Court's already ruled that they can't, they couldn't do it with Sora. And we would argue that they can't do it anymore for this issue with, uh, with our client on its licensing. So, Mr. Coleman, let me ask you just one question uh, before we go over to uh, the other side. Uh, yeah. Do you agree that the ex post facto, uh, uh, an ex post facto finding requires a determination that the, the uh, statute is punitive as opposed to- I think to that's civil part. Absolutely, Judge, I agree. I think that's part, and we go through that in our brief and why it is punitive here. And also I agree 100%, yes, yes. And then we rely on our cases. I, I would just, I don't know if you want me to go through the other questions, Judge, I'm happy to stop if that's enough. Um, if I want you to go through what? Uh, the other questions, you had two other questions, whether the yeah, statute- the, the question was which, if there's a conflict, and obviously right. I understand the answer about prospectivity and retroactivity, but looking at the two right. statutes as is, any any uh, statutory interpretation suggestion? Yeah, and, and your second question about the, whether it could be harmonized, I would argue yes, again, Tomokoski <laughs> harmonizes it, and the Supreme Court decision is our roadmap. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the- uh, um, Third question, Your Honor, which provisions, if, if it can't be harmonized, if for some reason Temelkowski is not dispositive here, um, you know, which provision takes priority? Well, I, I understand that the Attorney General is arguing that the licensing statute is the more specific, but I would argue here we're dealing with a Y, that's why Temelkowski came down the way it came down, was it's a YTA plea, and our client was never convicted and that's the specific statute dealing with this situation. And it has that language in there about the no civil disability, and I won't repeat all that. But, but that, I would argue, is the more specific. And even if, you know, 
the, the, our, our argument would still be, even if there is some kind of conflict or something, it's still a due process violation. It's still an ex post facto violation. And so therefore our client should be bailed. I, I, I think that's pretty much our position, Judge. Unless you have any other questions, I'm happy to respond. I, well, well, just one, which is, um, I'm sorry, there's a phone ring distracted yeah. me from. Um, would you agree that if, if, if we look at the statutes in conflict, if, if, we, if the court says that the HIDA uh, no civil disability has, has priority, then that completely eliminates the new provision, in, I mean, the statute in the new, pardon me, the provision in the new statute that says can't be HIDA and be a cop. Um, whereas if we, if the court were to find that, that the uh, more specific or controlling statute is the newer one, the HIDA statute would still remain in effect, uh, except for this situation. Well, I, yeah, I have two responses to that, Judge. Um, first off, there, it doesn't make it surplusage or, or get rid of it as long as it's treated prospectively, which of course is our argument going forward. Then of course it's still there. It doesn't negate the statute. It's there. Secondly, I would argue that then if, if that's the interpretation that's going to be followed, that makes the language under section, uh, let me find it, judge, um, 762.14 surplus, surplusage, because then it totally negates it and makes it un, usable and unenforceable. So that's our position, Judge, is that, you know, I, I, I'm not saying I don't see their argument. I, I, I see the, the position they're taking. I'm just saying it does the same thing on our side. And when you look at all this, the totality of the circumstances, the injustice and the unfairness of all of this, and our client having a nine-year career and being a police officer and doing it legally, and now going back and undoing his, just the entirety of the circumstances, Judge, just cries out for relief here. That's all. All right, thank you, Mr. Coleman. If you want to rebuttal, you have time. Okay, so, thank you, Judge. Mr. Sands? Good morning, Your Honor. Mark Sands, Assistant Attorney General for the Commission. The safety of the public requires that persons seeking to be licensed as police officers be held to the very highest standards of personal conduct and honesty. That's why the unfolds Act was enacted in the first place. That's why it was strengthened in 2016. And that's why the commission exists. So the public has confidence that our police officers are of the very highest caliber. Uh, I want to address the Tomokowski case because I agree. Uh, at first blush, this seems awfully, uh, awfully uh, close to what happened in Tomokowski, but there's a big difference here. And that is the difference between Haida and the Sex Offender Registration Act. Sex Offender Registration Act, at the time Mr. Temelkowski was convicted, didn't contemplate consideration of, of facts from a hiatus case. Hiatus, though, itself... Just that, Mr. Sands, it didn't contemplate what? It, it didn't contemplate hiatus status being considered for purposes of the Sex Offender Registration Act. That was, that was, the, uh, that was the constitutional infirmity. But here, at the time Mr. Oginski pled and was placed on hiatus status, that, that was different for licensure of police officers. In 1978, the Attorney General, in an AG opinion, recognized that HIDA doesn't prohibit dissemination of confidential records of a youthful trainee to police agencies for purposes of preparing a background report on the criminal history of an applicant or employment with that agency. And the HIDA statute itself also contemplates the use of HIDA material uh, for law enforcement personnel for use in the performance of their duties. In other words, there's no conflict between HIDA and the M. Coles Act because HIDA says that the police can use it in the conduct of their official duties. And the M. Coles Act tells you how they do that. They consider it for purposes of employment. So Mr. Oginski, always was aware or is presumed to be aware that his his plea and his height of status could still be considered if he sought licensure as a police officer. And that's what happened. Mr. Oginski's license was placed on inactive status. He sought to have it reinstated uh, because of, of the requirements of the act. The commission conducted a character and fitness review, and they determined that because of this conviction, he 
he was not eligible for licensure. There's no due process violation because he was always aware that that height of status could be considered uh, for purposes of, of whether or not he should be employed. I'm sorry, Your Honor. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about, in other words, you're saying that the, the, the provision allowing the police, allowing it to be disseminated to the police encompassed employment. Yes, absolutely, Your Honor. And that's what the AG said back in 1978, as we cited that in our brief. That's an attorney general letter 78 that says it can be considered for employment? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So um, tell me again why uh, Temokowski is not applicable, because as I read it, and, and I'm, I'm certainly happy to hear, hear your take on it, which is that uh, it says that if, if that as I read it, it says Haida says no civil um, uh, disability, and there is a civil disability, and so there's a due process problem because when he pled, it didn't exist. And your position is when he pled, it did exist. Yes, I, I, but how come it was never applied until the new statute then? Oh, it, I mean, it was, this information was always considered by, by law enforcement. Then why the change? Because they wanted, because the public demands that police officers be held to a higher standard. So they made the requirements more stringent. The legislature is, more yes, the legislature decided on behalf of the people that we needed to hold police officers to a higher standard. So we took information that was already being considered, had been considered since 1978, it was considered in the case of Mr. Oginski, and it simply said that not only is it should it be considered, uh, it should be dispositive. Right, hang on, I'm just looking for the site to this attorney general letter in your brief and maybe it's here and i'm missing it but or maybe it's in a case i don't i don't could you give me the site for the ag letter yes if you just give me one moment your honor you bet just need to find the brief i accidentally, i accidentally closed it before the hearing oh okay maybe it's in it I apologize, Your Honor, for the delay. No problem. You got all day. <laughs> I got time. You don't have time, but I got time. Oh, I found it. I apologize. Okay. There it is, right at the back of your brief. All right. Well, I'll, I, I confess I haven't reviewed it. I missed it, but I will. Um, and thanks for bringing that to my attention. You're very welcome. Um, Your anything else you want to cover? I do, Your Honor. I think it's also important to note that Mr. Oginski is not currently licensed as a police officer. As I just noted, when he uh, when he was fired by the Mount Morris Township Police Department, his license automatically went on inactive status and he was no longer authorized to act as a law enforcement agent. And just because he was rehired because of an arbitration hearing doesn't mean that he gets to automatically, as a matter of law, have his license reactivated. Rather, the M. Coles Act requires him to go through another character and fitness review. And I think it's interesting if you look at the notice of intent to deny, uh, the commission provided three reasons why Mr. Oginski should not be licensed. First of all, is, is, the convic uh, is the hiatus status that is the subject of this appeal. Second was a failure to disclose claim that was not substantiated at the administrative hearing. And third, the commission found that Mr. Oginski had serious character fitness concerns, even outside of the fact of the guilty plea. As we noted, even if you were to find that application of the automatic uh, disqualification uh, to Mr. Oginski violated his due process as, as applied to him, I think there's no question that that the factual basis for that conviction certainly can be considered by law enforcement. And so I think when you look at the circumstances surrounding that fleeing and eluding guilty plea and, and placement on hiatus status, um, some of his some of his other concerns in, in the conduct of, of his activities oh, as a police officer is something is something MCOL should consider also. So I think 
if you agree with Mr. Coleman that there was a violation, I think the the proper course of action would be then to remand back to the commission for consideration of whether those issues alone were sufficient to hold up his licensure. It's, I'm sorry, I have the, uh, the proposal for decision, but I don't seem to have the actual commission. I have the ALJ. Um, were there, did they make changes from the findings of the ALJ? No, the only reason why uh, Mr. Oginski's license was revoked was for the fact of the conviction. Okay. As Mr. Coleman pointed out, that's that's very clear in the record. Okay, thank you for clearing that up for me. Right. So there um, are other issues. And so I think the, the appropriate course of action is a remand to consider any other character fitness issues. Weren't, the, weren't those addressed? I thought it was just a failure to disclose and the ALJ said the evidence isn't there. The only things that were brought up for the ALJ were the fact of the conviction and the failure to disclose. And, and you know, as I said, as Mr. Coleman said, that one wasn't substantiated. What were the other issues? There were only two that were raised oh. at the administrative hearing, and that's this and the failure to disclose and the well, failure. What's the other issue that you want to remand for in the event that I, I rule a certain way? To consider other character fitness issues that might result in him not being eligible to be licensed. Were they raised? They were raised in the notice of intent to, 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 to deny, but they weren't brought before the administrative hearing. The commission proceeded only on the fact of the conviction and the failure to disclose. Okay. Anything else? Unless you have any more questions, Your Honor, we would rest on our brief. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I got to tell you, I think your position is, you know, you have a pretty strong position, but Ken Wilkowski really is a problem for you, I think. And I'd like to just hone in on that a little bit. It says that he claims he was, in, um, the, the defendant claims he was induced by Haida to plead guilty because the statute offered him potential benefits for pleading guilty he could not have otherwise attained, part of which is no civil disability. And, and I mean, I don't know how to, you, you have to help me to um, figure out why this is distinguishable. I know you referenced it and maybe you just need to repeat it, but I, I still don't get it. Because there's nothing in HIATA that says that it could be considered for purposes of the Sex Offender Registration Act. That's clear. It does oh, not, oh, yeah. but it didn't that. Oh. But the statute does say that it can, can be considered by law enforcement then and now, that it be, can be considered by law enforcement personnel in the performance of their duties. And one of their duties is obviously reviewing applicants to make sure that they have the requisite character and fitness necessary to be given a position of public trust. That's what the attorney general held in 1978. And that's what the statute said when Mr. Oginski pleaded guilty and was placed on hiatus status. So that's that's a huge difference between the statutes. Nothing at the time Mr. Temelkowski pleaded guilty would lead him to believe that it could be used in registration. So if that's the case, why did they need to pass the statute in 2016? Be they, they needed to because they wanted to make the existence of these adjudications of guilt mandatory rather than discretionary reasons not to hire these law enforcement officers. And again, it goes back to the legislature's desire to have the highest quality personnel possible as our law enforcement agents. Okay. I understand. Maybe they should double their pay. They'll get better people, but I shouldn't say better people. <laughs> They'll, they'll I understand get... what you mean, Your Honor. Pardon? I understand what you mean, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Kalman, rebuttal? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I think this is a distinction without meaning. I mean, Temelkowski doesn't talk about accident. This is nothing that was even brought up. That isn't the distinction in this case at all. And, you know, again, I think it's very clear that, you know, to say that the YTA and the Temelkowski case of Sora, that they, that was different and somehow it wasn't contemplated. Well, Your Honor, that almost proves our point. I mean, they changed the law in 2016, you know? I mean, it, to now argue, oh, it was there all along. I, I mean, it's silly. I, my client went through the proper processes and the vetting and the background checks and was hired and got his license and was hired. Um, the, the argument that, um, 
So I, the fact that it was in 2016, I think, proves our point. And again, the fact that the police could use the information does not necessarily, I, I disagree that that means MCOLS gets to use it as a licensing sanction. Where does it say that back before the 2016 law? It doesn't say that. Access to the information does not equal, we can deny you because of anything that happened under YTA. That's not there, that's not clear. The only thing that's clear in the statute is there's no civil disability and I won't repeat the whole thing. That's clearly in the statute. So the statute says it could be used by police for their purposes. Um, this talk about AG letters or other things, I don't see where that is any kind of binding authority or takes or trumps the statutes themselves or the due process violations, the, everything we've argued here. An AG opinion doesn't, doesn't change any of that. And again, you're going to bring up again the character issue <laughs> and then I'm questioning like, well, yeah, we understand. It was really just the failure to give the information, which he did give the information, and then the conviction. Those are the only two reasons. To now bring that up and try to argue to the court to remand it based on that, I think shows almost the desperation of the AG's you know, position here. They're trying to figure some way to try to salvage something here. Give us a second bite at the apple, judge. Yeah, we didn't appeal anything. <laughs> Yeah, that's not raised. It's not preserved. We waived it. But send it back and let us bring up a whole bunch of new stuff anyway and stuff that's not even before the court today. I don't think that's an appropriate remedy at this point at all and would ask the court to deny that. Um, so, look, the bottom line here is, that yes, they knew about our client's YTA status when he was originally licensed. And if the law says what the AG says it says, that, that he would, should have been denied at that point, why wasn't he? The only thing that changed is the 2016 law, and Temelkowski is right on point uh, and with what occurs here, and it was dealing with a YTA case. So we asked the court to reverse our client's uh, the decision here, allow our client to resume his professional career, and we agree totally. Mr. Sands' first statement about the safety of the, of the public is paramount. Absolutely. And you have a fine officer here with nine years of experience. And, and this is a profession having trouble getting and keeping people today. And he wants to continue this. It, I agree. It deals with the safety of the public. And you've got somebody here who they want to tar and feather for the rest of his life over an issue. And we're not even have gotten into the merits of the underlying case. But, you know, it, it flies in the face of the whole purpose of the YTA statute which is to give people a second chance at life, especially young people like Mr. Oginski was. That's the whole point, Judge. And the safety of the public is going to be harmed if this fine officer is not allowed to resume his career. Thank you. Gentlemen, I just want to be clear on a, on a fact, because it's, it's something one of you mentioned. Is, is it correct that now uh, Mr. Oginski is an employee of the department, but not licensed? Sounded like they, there was some an arbitration that reinstated him or something. No, what what happened, Judge, is he had initially been fired from his Mount Morris position over in his opinion. You know, he fought the charges over bogus claims that he had falsified something or other. It went to arbitration. Mr. Oginski won, and so he was put back. And so what happened was when he came back to say, "Okay, I won. I get my job back." <laughs> okay. Then that's when M. Cole stepped in and said, oh, too bad, 2016, you know, you're, you're no good. So that's the sequence, Judge. Mr. Sands, anything? I'm, you know, I know normally it's, uh, you know, uh, appellant and appellee rebuttal, but if either of you have anything you want to add, I'm open to hearing it. I think I got what I need here, but I'm, if you got something else to say, you're welcome. I, I have nothing else to add, Your Honor. Uh, I, I try not to talk anymore when the judge says I got it. <laughs> I agree. I appreciate these these arguments and your excellent briefs. I, I hope uh, we'll have an opinion out to you uh, within 28 days. Typically, we do, and uh, and then you'll take it from there, however it goes. All right. So, all right. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, and you'll let the court reporter know if you want uh, to order. All righty. All right. Thank, thank you, you Judge. Honor. Thanks for the time. Bye. Okay. Um, I, before I forget, can I get a spelling on that case that both of you are um, 
<laughs> it's not self-evident. I mean, come on. <laughs> I can spell the last three letters. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's it's people v. Temelkowski. It's T-E-M-E-L-K-O-S-K-I. Okay. Oh, I would I would have been very, very close. <laughs> I was gonna say it, it does kind of look like it sounds. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I would have researched it. You just saved me a minute. Um do you want transcripts? How yes, do you, please. You both do. Uh, I'll wait and see what the judge decides. Okay. I'll let you know. Do you have an email or a phone? I Elaine? do. I, I yeah. do. Um, I'm with Hanson Renaissance Reporting. And let me just okay. give you their phone number. Five, okay. three, one, area code 313 yeah. 567 8100. Okay. But I want to give you um, my personal email. Okay, great. So, so it's Meda M A D A reporting, all one word. Okay. At gmail.com. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so Meda reporting at gmail.com if you need me. Okay. And um and I think we're all set. Oh, oh, can someone email me a caption to that email address? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to do that uh, right now. Thank you so much. Thanks, and now Mary. we're no really problem. Now we're really all set. <laughs> all right. And Mark, good to see you. It's nice to see you too, Dave. And thanks all again right. for accommodating uh, my surprise oh. at this case being scheduled oh, for our Of course, man. Anytime. You know, I, I hope everything's fine. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, was, I was thrilled that it, you got it the next week. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. All right. All right. Thanks. All so right. Much. See you guys. Really Thank fun. you, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye bye yeah, now. Bye bye.